His name has become synonymous with the dunk contest and the Reebok pumps, but as time has gone on, that seems to be all he's associated with. But as an overall player, D. Brown was better than he gets credit for. He joined the Celtics during the tail end of their Big 3 era as an exciting and athletic spark plug, one of the quickest players you'd ever see who could jump out of the gym and finish while still being able to play good defense. He played for the love of the game, which made it more unfortunate when he went down with a serious knee injury early in his career. He would come back and eventually have a couple really good years in the wake of the Reggie Lewis tragedy, before quickly falling out of favor in Boston as their backcourt became more and more crowded. He would get some redemption during his brief time in Toronto before ending his career in Orlando, as he played over a decade in the NBA. And even though D. Brown is forever immortalized for his 91 dunk contest performance, he was so much more than just a novelty dunker. Let's jog your memory. A Florida native, DeCoven D. Brown would grow up in Jacksonville, where he would eventually attend the Bulls school during his teenage years, which had one of the best athletic programs in the state. And during his time there, he would lead the Bulldogs to back-to-back -back state finals appearances as he would earn all state honors as a senior in 1986. D. Brown would stay in state and attend Jacksonville University, and there's not really any footage out there and only a few pictures, so I'm gonna quickly summarize his time there. Brown played sparingly during his 87 freshman season, appearing in 21 games and getting less than 9 minutes per game, on the best Dolphins team of his time there, as they would finish at 19 and 11, but would lose to Vanderbilt in the first round of the NIT. By his sophomore season, Brown was a starter, and would respond by becoming the team's second leading scorer while also leading the team in steals. But their team scoring had seen a huge drop, as they would finish at 8 and 21. He would break out as a junior in 1989, as the 6-1 guard would lead the team in scoring, rebounding, and steals, while playing nearly 38 minutes per game, with his 56 total steals leading the conference. And this would all lead to him being voted second team all Sun Belt. But the Dolphins' 14 and 16 record wouldn't get them any postseason berths. 1990 was Brown's best. As a senior, he would again lead the team in scoring on a career-high shooting percentage, as he would be a top 5 scorer in the conference, but he would also set the program and conference single-season steals record, with 88, for an average of 3 per game. But the Dolphins would only manage a 13-16 record, and again miss out on any postseason play, as Brown was named first team all-conference. So after a good 4-year college career, Brown would enter the 1990 NBA Draft. However, he wasn't a super well-known prospect until his performance at the Orlando All-Star Classic in April, when he made the All-Tournament team averaging more than 18 points per game. So some teams had been scouting him and felt he could be a diamond in the rough, as he was lightning quick with an incredible motor and showed an ability to play bigger than his 6'1 frame due to his athleticism, even sometimes playing small forward in college. But this was still 1990. And with Brown's primary position listed as shooting guard, yet his size being more prototypical of a point guard, he was more of a tweener. Yet a little past the halfway point of the first round, Brown was off the board. So clearly Brown had the potential to be something special, as not only did the Celtics see enough in him to make him a first round pick, but reportedly the Lakers' Jerry West was hoping he would fall to them at 27. A big part of the reason that Brown was drafted was because the Celtics were unsure if their point guard Brian Shaw was going to be playing for them after he had spent the past year playing in Italy, even though he had signed a contract with Boston in early 1990, agreeing to suit up for them in the 91 season. This would lead to a somewhat famous court case, but eventually Shaw was ordered to honor his commitment to the Celtics. But Celtics coach Chris Ford would also speak to Brown as a player, saying that his quickness and ability to create off the dribble was intriguing, but also his ability to be a pest on the defensive end. And on top of this, he could bring a level of excitement to an aging Celtics team. They had chose to let franchise legend Dennis Johnson walk after the 1990 season, and their trio of Larry Bird, Robert Parrish, and Kevin McHale were each at least 33 years old, with Bird's back really starting to fail him. Their most promising player was a 25-year-old Reggie Lewis, who was set to take the torch from Bird after he retired. And the Celtics fans would appreciate the youth movement that Boston seemed to be heading towards, as Lewis, Brown, Shaw, and Kevin Gamble would be referred to by some as the Zip Boys. Additionally, once Brown arrived in Boston, he signed a deal with the lesser-known Reebok to endorse their shoes. And even though he would become synonymous with the pumps a little later, he would say that the main reasons for him signing with Reebok was due to them being based in Boston so he could stay local. 
but also because he hated taping his ankles. And their pump technology allowed him to tighten his shoes instead of taping his ankles. So with Shaw back and a still established team in place, Brown wouldn't have a huge role to begin his rookie year, but he would still have his moments. Over the team's first 47 games, he was getting about 21 minutes per game and putting up modest stats, but would hit double figures in 17 of those games, including a seven game stretch in late December to early January, where he hit double figures in every game. But then All-Star Weekend came around, and this is where D. Brown would make an everlasting impression on the NBA. February 9th was the dunk contest, and Brown was a late addition to a lineup full of high flyers, and the first Boston Celtic to ever participate in the dunk contest. Seattle's Sean Kemp was the favorite to win, as not many people were thinking the 6'1 Brown, who was the shortest participant, would even make noise. But he had other ideas. Yet before he dunked it, he had to stop and pump up his Reebok Pump Omnizone 2 sneakers, which was an iconic move that would bring Reebok invaluable publicity and popularity. But it would also really get the crowd behind him. But you can't pull something like that and then not deliver. So Brown made sure he delivered. The crowd had gotten into it after his first dunk, but then he really started getting creative with a never before seen variation of the two ball dunk and would pull off one of the cleanest double clutch reverse dunks of all time. But he would save his best for last as his final dunk still remains one of the most iconic in dunk contest history. Brown would go up for what looked like a pretty routine dunk, but would cover his eyes with his right arm while dunking with his left, which would get him an almost perfect score, as he would defeat Kemp to take home the crown. And interestingly enough, Brown would later say that this was more of a backup, as originally he planned to wear a Reebok hat and tip it to the crowd during his dunk. Yet this was considered a prop, and props weren't allowed, so he would switch it up at the last minute. And while Brown was so much more than a dunker, this performance had fans all over the country wanting to catch a glimpse of him when the Celtics came to town. So after the break, Brown would see a slight increase in his playing time, as over the final 35 games of the year, he would receive over 5 more minutes per game, including 5 starts, as his numbers improved, and included 3 games with at least 20 as he would finish the season top 10 among rookies in scoring and steals while finishing second to Gary Payton in assists, as he was voted first team all-rookie. And the Celtics would finish with a 56-26 and 26 record and get a first round matchup with Indiana. This series would be closer than expected due to a great performance from Chuck Person, but Brown would still manage 19 minutes per game off the bench while averaging about 8 points, 3 rebounds, and a steal per game, and would record double figures in two of those games as Boston would eventually outlast Indiana to take the series in five, setting up a matchup with the defending champion Detroit Pistons. And this is where Brown would shine. Brown's speed and quickness would give the Celtics an added dimension in this series, which the Pistons' Isaiah Thomas had trouble keeping up with, as the Celtics would try their best to exploit this by giving Brown over 31 minutes per game off the bench, averaging about 15 points, five rebounds and five assists on over 56% shooting. And there were plenty of times where Brown would make the Pistons look like they were moving in slow motion. He would have just 12 points in a game one loss, but would then go off for 22 points and eight assists in a game two win. And then he would have 13, nine and six as Boston took a 2-1 lead. He would cool off in game four with eight points on four of 12 shooting in a loss before coming back with a 19 point, 10 assist double-double in what would be another loss but the Celtics were without Robert Parrish for Game 6. And even though Brown had 21-5-4 on nearly 70% shooting off the bench, Boston lost by 4 in overtime to end their season, as Brown's rookie year would see him average about 8.5 points, 4 assists, and a steal per game. 1992 was looking like a great opportunity for Brown to break out, and after his great end to last season, it looked like he could very well be the Celtics' starting point guard in year two, especially since Shaw was recovering from a hamstring injury to begin the year. But then just days before the season opener, Brown went down. In an October 29th practice, Brown would tear the lateral meniscus cartilage in his left knee, and this was a tough injury for a player whose athleticism was such a big part of his game. And it was also during a time before a lot of surgical advancements had been made. So an injury like this could easily end or at least alter a career. Yet although it was serious, it wouldn't end Brown's season, as he would be back in the lineup by early February. Bird would be limited to 45 games this year, and Mikhail would only appear in 56. And Shaw was now gone, as a few weeks before Brown came back, the Celtics sent him to the Heat for Sherman Douglas. John Bagley would be the starter once Brown returned, but once he got a few games under his belt, Brown would enter the starting lineup for the remainder of the year. 
and overall would build on his numbers from last year. His efficiency dropped, but it was somewhat understandable, as he would settle for more jump shots while getting more comfortable on his knee. But he would still have periods where he'd show his supreme athleticism. And by season's end, the Celtics were 51 and 31 and set to take on Indiana in round one. Bagley would replace Brown in the starting lineup for the postseason, as Brown had sat out the final five games of the regular season, as well as missed their first round series, due to what was described as a serious case of the flu. Yet the Celtics would make quick work of Indiana with a sweep. Brown would be back for their second round series versus Cleveland but would go scoreless in 6 minutes of action in Game 1, before sitting out Game 2, as the series was tied 1-1. He would give the Celtics good production over the rest of the series, but it was up and down, hitting double figures in 3 games, yet 6 points or less in the other 3 games, as the Celtics would eventually lose in 7, and Brown's shortened year would see him average about 11.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 5.5 assists per game. But this loss had marked the end of an era in Boston. After 13 seasons at age 35, Larry Bird retired Tuesday in Boston. Bird would announce his retirement after the season, leaving Lewis as their top player, yet still featuring an aging Parrish and McHale. But the Celtics would bring in forward Xavier McDaniel as well. Brown would play a much healthier season as he would appear in 80 games. He would begin coming off the bench, but after 9 games he would become the team's starting point guard and would again put up respectable numbers but then he would be benched in favor of Sherman Douglas, with about a month and a half left in the year. Yet in those final 23 games off the bench, he would play very efficiently. And overall this year, he would hit double figures in 48 games and record 11 double-doubles, including a career-high 18 assists to go along with 15 points in a February 16th loss to Phoenix, as he would average a career-high 5.8 assists per game. And on the defensive end, he would lead the Celtics in steals per game as they would finish with a 48-34 and 34 record and get a first round matchup with Charlotte. Brown would come off the bench and put up 16 points and 7 assists in a Game 1 win, as he had to take on more minutes after Reggie Lewis would collapse on the court in the first quarter, and only play a few more minutes in the game before being shut down for the series. So Brown was a starter for Game 2, and would put up 13-5-5 five five in a loss, and then put up 11 points in a Game 3 loss before recording just 5 points in 23 minutes in a last second Game 4 loss, which ended their season, as 93 had seen Brown average about 11 points, 6 assists, and 1.5 and steals per game. But Boston was about to be blindsided by tragedy over the offseason. Lewis would tragically pass away over the summer, after collapsing again during a July workout, as he was just 27 at the time of his passing. So on top of this being a crushing blow to their team, this was likely going to be an emotional season for Brown, as he and Lewis had become very good friends. Boston would finally welcome big man Dino Raja from Europe, who they had drafted back in 89, yet would just join the team now. So although there were always going to be expectations on Brown, the passing of Lewis put added pressure on him to have a great year. And even though it wasn't a breakout, it was a big improvement and would give fans something to cheer for. The Celtics were now without Mikhail as he had retired. And although Raja would appear in 80 games, he would only start 47 of them. Brown had been shifted to shooting guard as he and Douglas now made up the starting backcourt. And even though Brown had point guard size, his game was probably more suited for shooting guard as he would lead the team in scoring on a then career high scoring average while shooting a very respectable 48% and still showing an ability to distribute, as he would finish second on the team in assists. Additionally, his career-high two steals per game would lead the team and be top 10 in the league. However, for as good as Brown could be at forcing turnovers, bigger two guards would often take Brown to the post and use their size advantage. But overall, Brown would hit double figures in 58 games, which would include his first career 40-point game in an April 22nd defeat of Chicago, when he finished with 40 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists, and 4 steals. But after being a team so accustomed to winning for a decade and a half, the Celtics would have their first losing season since 1979, and their 32-50 record wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth, as Brown's year ended with him averaging about 15.5 points, 4.5 assists, and 2 steals per game. Over the offseason, Brown would sign a 6-year extension worth nearly $21 million, and aside from Parrish no longer being a Celtic, it was much of the same in 95, as Brown would continue as the team's starting two-guard, but would fall to third on the team in scoring, behind Raja and the newly acquired Dominique Wilkins, who signed with the Celtics in free agency. So although he was third on the team in scoring, Brown would average a career-high 15.6 points per game, as overall he would hit double figures in 63 games, which included scoring a career-high 41 points on two separate occasions. With the addition of Wilkins, the Celtics had a solid scoring offense, 
but their scoring defense was near the bottom of the league, and after 70 games they were 27-43, and but they would go 8-4 to end the year, as their 35-47 and record was enough for the last playoff spot in the East, where they would get Orlando in round 1. It didn't start good, as the Magic won game 1 by 47 points, with Brown putting up 24-4, and but then the Celtics would shockingly even the series in game 2, as Brown played all 48 minutes and would finish with 21 points, 8 rebounds, and 4 assists. Although Game 3 would be another loss, it was only by 5 points, with Brown putting up 16 points, 4 boards, and 6 assists. Then he would finish with 18 points, 4 rebounds, and 5 assists before fouling out of Game 4, as the Celtics would lose this one by just 3 points, but it would end their season, as Brown's year would see him average about 15.5 points, 4 assists, and 1.5 and steals per game. But unfortunately, this had been the peak of Brown's career. Boston would fire head coach Chris Ford in the offseason, as team executive ML Carr would replace him, but Brown would see his role decrease. After averaging over 36 minutes per game over the last two seasons, he would get less than 25 minutes this year. And after starting 22 of the first 28 games he played, he would be relegated to a bench role the rest of the year, as he had been having the worst shooting season of his career up to that point. But with the team getting good contributions from guys like Dana Barros and David Wesley, the Celtics' backcourt was more crowded than ever, and Brown was looking like the odd man out. He would score nearly 5 less points per game for the season, on less than 40% shooting. And Brown's frustrations reached a boiling point in early January, when after a loss to Portland, which marked their 7th loss in their last 8 games, Brown had grown frustrated of his lack of playing time, and would tear apart his locker, and also ask for a trade. So this would be a forgettable season for Brown, but it would also be forgettable for the Celtics, as they would finish at 33-49 and, and miss the playoffs with Brown averaging about 10.5 points, 2 assists, and a steal per game. After a few seasons as team captain, Brown had been stripped of that status in favor of Rick Fox going into the 97 season, and the Celtics had picked up Kentucky forward Antoine Walker in the 96 draft, as Brown, at just 28 years old, was one of the team's elder statesmen, and injuries would have him really struggling to stay on the court, as although he would again get about 25 minutes per game, he would only appear in 21 games as he dealt with knee, toe, and back issues, so he could never get going this season, as the Celtics would finish as one of the league's worst teams, at 15-67, and 67. and Brown's injury-filled year had seen him average about 7.5 points, 3 assists, and 1.5 and steals per game. Boston had a new coach going into 98 in Rick Pitino, and Pitino would have Brown take a different approach to his fitness, as reportedly Brown had made it a habit to come to camp overweight, so he could stay bulked up over the long season. But Patino wanted Brown at a lower weight to maximize his quickness and elusiveness. So Brown had been following a rigorous summer training routine. And even though it never seemed that Brown and Carr saw eye to eye, Brown would still take full responsibility for the last two years, not putting any blame on Carr. Brown was relatively healthy, appearing in 41 of the team's first 52 games. But his minutes continued to decrease as the Celtics went in a younger direction. And then on February 18th, the last remaining Celtic to play with Larry Bird or Reggie Lewis was gone. Boston saw an opportunity to pick up a more established guard in Kenny Anderson, who had been traded to Toronto but refused to report. So they would include Brown in a package to the Raptors to acquire Anderson, as Brown's somewhat difficult time in Boston was over, which he would later describe as a tough time for him after the sudden passings of Lewis and Len Bias, as well as the retirement of Bird. Brown would join an 11-40 Raptors team and would appear in every remaining game in a much larger role as he would get over 29 minutes off the bench and in that time he would bump up his numbers significantly. But the Raptors were still one of the league's worst teams, finishing at 16-66, and 66, as Brown's overall season had seen him average about 9 points, 2 assists, and a steal per game. But the lockout-shortened 99 season would be a bit of a resurgence for D. Brown. The Raptors made a couple big splashes, as they had come out of the 98 NBA draft with the high-flying Vince Carter. And the following day, they had traded their top draft pick from two years earlier in Marcus Camby to the Knicks. But the Raptors had two up-and-coming stars in Carter and his cousin Tracy McGrady. Yet they would also get a great season from Brown, as he would appear in 49 games and act as the team's sixth man. He would put up his highest scoring average since 1995, and although he would shoot just 37.8% from the field, he would actually shoot a higher percentage from three as 70% of his shots came from beyond the arc, leading to a 38.7% clip, as he would lead the NBA in makes and attempts from deep. 
he would hit double figures in 26 games, including 5 with at least 20, and would drain a career-high 9 three-pointers in an April 28th loss to Milwaukee, as he would even finish 5th in 6th man of the year voting. But the Raptors would go just 23-27 and, and miss the playoffs, as Brown's season would see him average about 11 points, 3 assists, and a steal per game. Shortly before the 2000 season, Brown would have arthroscopic surgery on his left knee and wouldn't make his first appearance until mid-November. Then in late November, he would re-injure his knee in practice and would only appear in 12 games over the next 3 months, as overall he would manage just 38 games and play limited minutes when he was on the court. But the Raptors would go 45-37 and to make their first postseason appearance in franchise history versus the New York Knicks. Although Brown appeared in every game, he would only get about 6 minutes per game with minimal contributions as the Raptors were swept, with Brown's season ending with him averaging about 7 points, 2.5 assists, and half a steal per game. Brown was a free agent and would sign with Orlando for the 01 season, as he was supposed to give them good point guard minutes off the bench. But then in training camp, he would tear a tendon above his left knee and would only return in April to play 7 games at the end of the year. The Magic had finished at 43-39 and, and would get a first round matchup with Milwaukee, and Brown would get solid minutes as he would even go for 12 points in nearly 24 minutes of action in a Game 3 win. But also during that game, he had left the bench during a Scott Williams bow outlaw scuffle, which led to him being suspended for Game 4, as the Magic lost to end their season. And Brown's season had seen him average about 7 points, 1.5 assists, and half a steal per game. Brown would announce his retirement in August, and take up a job in the Orlando front office. But a late season injury to Mike Miller, with the Magic still in the hunt for a playoff spot, would lead to them coaxing Brown into signing a 10 day contract for some depth until Miller returned, as he would appear in 7 games for the team late in the year, before being released about 2 weeks later on March 29th, as his 7 games would see him average about 1 point, half an assist, and half a steal per game. And this would be the true end of Brown's playing days, as he would later carve out a second career as a WNBA head coach and later an NBA assistant. First and foremost, D. Brown will always be remembered for his 91 dunk contest, and rightfully so. And while there's nothing wrong with that being your legacy, he really was a lot better than the numbers say. Injuries unfortunately affected his play as he saw his role decline after a couple of his best years. But he could give you production on both ends of the court while never seeming to get tired. And even though he was an undersized two guard, when he was at his best, he had pretty respectable efficiency. Yet his size would also permit him to play the point when needed. He had a lot thrust on him after Larry Bird's retirement and Reggie Lewis's death. So even though he played well, it didn't seem like enough. But if certain circumstances change, he might be remembered in a much better light. But even with how things turned out, the overall career of D. Brown deserves a lot of respect and appreciation. But that's it for today's episode on D. Brown. Hope you enjoyed it, and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on his fallen teammate. Or this one, on another player remembered most for his dunk contest performance. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.